It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Kevin Frawley, DDS, and sitting next to him is his business partner, Chase White. Dr. Frawley is co a committed dental professional and teacher helping patients create the smile they were meant to have. He practices in Beverly Hills with his son, Dr. Sean Frawley, and his daughter, Dr. Michelle Frawley. He received his undergraduate degree from UCLA with a BS in biology in 77. He enjoyed being a Bruin so much that after he completed his dental degree at UCLA as well. After dental school, he completed a residency at the Veterans Administration in Westwood. He began teaching at UCLA and established his private practice in cosmetic and implant dentistry in Beverly Hills. Dr. Frawley is committed to the development of dentistry on all levels and is involved with both local and national dental associations. He's a member of the ADA, the CDA, and many other organizations. He is past president of the Beverly Hills Academy of Dentistry and past president of the Los Angeles Dental Society. He served as a CDA delegate for over 25 years and is a trustee for the California Dental Association for six years. He lectures both nationally and internationally on bone grafting and implants. He teaches live surgical courses at well that enable practicing dentists to gain the experience they need to feel confident to begin grafting and placing implants. Dr. Frawley is the founder and CEO of Surgical Aesthetics Biomedical. Surgical Aesthetics is dedicated to providing great materials and education to the dental profession. Thank you so much, Kevin, for taking your time out of your busy Beverly Hills practice to come on my show and talk to my homies about all things surgical aesthetics how are you doing i'm doing great i'm doing great thank you howard and thank you for the introduction i, I appreciate it and chase you're his business partner trusty sidekick he can't get rid of <laughs> <laughs> well very good well you know um I, I i got i could talk to you for 40 days and 40 nights i love your website uh, you have two thank websites you. one's surgicalaesthetics.com and then the other one's beverlyhillsdentistry.com now i got i got to be straight up with you Dr. Frawley, right out of the gate. Um, when I came to Arizona, I did all the demographics and I found two areas that needed a dentist. I mean, why create why create demand? You should just go fill demand. Why, why, why do you set up a dental office and try to advertise and create all this demand? I mean, I did the whole demographics of Phoenix back in 87 and the, southern, the southernmost part of Ahwatukee only had one dentist for every 6,000 and Northern Scottsdale only had one dentist for 6,000. That's where I opened my doors. But I picked Phoenix over Scottsdale because growing up in Kansas, going to undergrad in Nebraska, dental school, Missouri, I feel like a, a short, fat, bald, fruffy guy like me uh, would probably be better <laughs> off doing meat and potatoes dentistry uh, than hooting and hollering up in Scottsdale with all the richy rich. But the the but when you're a Beverly Hills dentist, man, you have people walking in with high expectations. Is that kind of stressful? You know, Yes and no. Um, you know, I, I think uh, I have a wide range of people that, that, that entered my practice and certainly had I approached it uh, in a more business-like manner initially, like, like what you did, it certainly makes a lot more sense to do what you did. I was fortunate in that uh, one of my instructors who I worked with a lot at UCLA had a Navy buddy that practiced in Beverly Hills and was only going to practice a few more years. And he put me in touch with him, and the guy turned out to be just a wonderful man, and we had a great relationship. He was like my grandfather, and, and so I kind of stepped into a, a very mature practice. He had practiced for 50 years, um, and I was just just very fortunate, and you know, I kind of just grew it from there, and, and I think it would have been crazy to go into that kind of market and just open a practice. Um, but I ended up you know, with a, a good, solid base, and and uh, kind of grew it from there. So it, it, it worked out really well for me. So are you in um, Beverly Hills proper or Northridge? Or is that the same thing or next to each other? Or what is that? No, so my, my dental practice is in Beverly Hills, but Surgical Aesthetics, uh, the regenerative company, is in Northridge, California. And is that Which right? is, you know, part. Well, um, so I, I already know what my homies are thinking. They're driving to work. You know, podcasters are under 30. People that are our age read books and uh, new old newspapers. I still get black <laughs> ink all over my hand on Sunday <laughs> from reading the newspaper. And I'm probably the only guy in my neighborhood old enough to read a newspaper. Um, but they're coming. I know what they're thinking. They're driving to work right now. And they're saying, Dr. Frawley, I graduated. I went to four years of dental school. I got $400,000 in student loans. I never placed one implant. How right. coach her? How does she go from never placing an implant? Nobody has four hundred grand in debt because she's thinking, 
if I get into implants, do I need to buy a hundred thousand dollars CBCT and take a hundred thousand dollars and you know courses and and you know what what would you say to her if she's never placed a single implant? How would you coach her on her journey? So uh, I think that a lot that the way that the the kind of the word the implant world has kind of gone over the last ten years is kind of backwards. You know, people want to take a, either you know a quickie continuum or they want to take a, a, a quickie course and start you know placing implants and and everybody talks about the, that you know placing guided surgery is a no-brainer and, and you just get in there and you drill a hole you throw in the implant and and everything is cool so uh, you know my journey was much different than that um, certainly as an old timer uh, you know, we kind of got the hang of, of surgery before you jumped in to, and just started throwing implants. So you learned how to handle soft tissue, you learned how, you know, how things heal, what to do. So, you know, my point is, especially when people are starting the journey, is start the journey with grafting all your extractions. Learn about grafting, learn about healing, learn about handling the soft tissue, and then you you move into implants. And certainly there is, you know, a place for for doing things guided, but if if you you know don't have surgical skills and rely on doing everything guided when something goes wrong you know you're in the proverbial creek and don't know what to do um so when when uh when i started surgical aesthetics uh which is a kind of regenerative allograft company about seven eight years ago you know the the idea was you know to provide bone grafting material and surgical uh, supplies and and kind of provide that for the you know, kind of leaning towards the general dentist. Um, and then what we kind of found out was that it was just a, a real hole in the in the educational process and how you get going. You know, there was lots of, you know, expensive weekend courses and stuff, but the really the idea of how you get going uh, was really an issue. Um, so we kind of changed the direction of the, of the company from a kind of a, uh, direct seller, which most of the implant companies and regenerative companies are, to selling through distribution. So, so we sell through Henry Schein, Patterson, Pearson, Benco, Burkhart, and all the local smaller uh, uh, dealers as well. Um, and so, a lot of the courses that we do, the the uh, kind of the one day hands on kind of courses, we do them in in conjunction a lot with the different distributors. Um, so. We've really designed the the courses to be, um, you know, you take it a, a, a one day course. It's a kind of hands on using models, but but our goal is that you know if you do, haven't done any grafting, you've done minimal grafting. That very next extraction you do, you should be able to graft it, um, and then kind of start on your journey. So that's kind of our our deal. And you know, one of the things that we've noticed to kind of tie into that to add on is. Uh, when we do these courses, a lot of times we'll have people come who have placed 5, 10, 15, 20 implants, and they feel like they're you know pretty experienced, they got the hang of it. And then one of the things we do in the course is we teach some suturing techniques. And a lot of times we find out pretty quickly, yeah, you've done 20 implants or so, but we could use a little practice on the suturing. So people think there's you know maybe a lot of glory in the implants, that's more fun, that's exciting. Well, let's take it back to basics and let's learn the suturing techniques you know, how to handle the tissue so that your grafts and your implants turn out successfully. So let's, so you made a very bold claim. You said, um, you know, start grafting all your extractions. So I'm gonna play. So first of all, let, let's start with basics. Why do you want to graft all your extractions? And then number two, how do you graft it? What materials do you use? Uh, to talk, talk about the why. Well, well you know, you, it's like saying go to LA, but why do I want to go to LA? Why, why do I want to graft all my extractions? Well, I, I mean, there's no doubt if, if you graft the extraction, you're going to get better healing. You know, there, there could be an argument as to whether or not um, if you're going to do a denture or if you're not going to place an implant, whether or not you should graft it. But if you could preserve the bone, I think you're always better. So you're absolutely going to preserve more bone when you graft it than if you let a socket collapse. Uh, it's not a difficult procedure. Uh, you know, if you could do a reasonable class two composite, you can certainly graft a socket. There's just some basic principles and some instrumentation uh, that that you need, uh, but I think once you have that, uh, it just makes a world of difference. 
I just I can't think of a reason not to graft the extraction. So is your company called Surgical Aesthetics or Surgical Surgical Aesthetics Biomedical? Uh, basically, we kind of go go by Surgical Aesthetics, but the technical name is Surgical Aesthetics Biomedical Technologies. Biomedical. And and what what do you what does your company actually sell? I mean, is is it so online sell- CE? It's education, and is it all the materials for bone grafting? Well, it started out as materials for bone grafting. Started out with a, a particulate allograft that Dr. Frawley helped design uh, with a certain porosity and technique to it, so we could get really great results. But as the company grew and people, you know, really liked the product, they said, "Well, you know, I need some sutures too, or I need some membrane too. What what should I use?" And so gradually, we started adding products into that portfolio so that we could have all the products you need for grafting. And then, like Dr. Frawley said. As, as we you know, watched people use these products and got to know the market is when we discovered that great products are one thing, but how to use them is an entirely different thing. So that's when we added on the educational side of the company. So one of the things we used to, uh, for the first number of years, uh, we, we partnered with Hugh Friedy, who's a great partner, um, and put on courses, and so they would supply instruments. Um, And then we just found that there was an impediment to jumping on board because of the kit that we were recommending was really expensive. Um, So we started sourcing our own instruments. So our our goal is truly that you take our one day hands-on course and you will be grafting the next day. So, um, you know, I like you have sat through thousands and thousands of hours of continued education in dentistry and you know, you you go to great courses and you see amazing cases that people do, but I'd say a large percentage of the time I would walk away from a course and not really know how to do it. You know, not feel like I could duplicate the results of what that what the person was showing me. He was showing me his amazing stuff, and is that you know one out of ten? Is that nine out of ten? Uh, and did you did he tell you how to do it? So. Our goal is really how to. So yeah, we talk about the research and we talk about you know the biology behind what we do, but but it's really a how to. It's if you're gonna remove the granulation tissue, what instrument do you use? How do you do it? What is the feel for the instrument? So we talk a lot. We, you know, it's really based on a how to approach. There's a uh, four types of graphs. Uh, why did you choose allograft? There's Autograft, where you take a graft taken from one part of the body of an individual and transplant it onto another site in the same individual, like a skin graft. There's an isograft, graft taken from one individual and placed on another individual of the same genetic constitution, like grafts between identical twins. There's allografts, which you say you do, graft taken from one individual placed on genetically non-identical members of the same species. And then there's xenograft taken from one individual placed on an individual belonging to another species, like animal to man. Why, why did you pick, um, of those four grafts, why did you pick allograft? So in dentistry, you, you're, you're kind of your main graphs that are available are autograph, which is the gold standard, no doubt about it. If you can take a graft, you know, from one part of the mouth and use it in another part, that's your best material. But, you know, there's a lot of morbidity with that. Um, and so while that is ideal, um, it's not practical in many, in many circumstances. So that kind of leaves you with um, allograft, which is basically human uh, bone from donors, uh, where all the DNA is, re- is removed so that there's, there's no uh, rejection of the material. Um, and then the other uh, options would be a xenograft, which is uh, basically bone from another species. Um, and then there's synthetics. So the problem with the xenografts and the synthetics is that uh, be not being human bone, they don't they don't process the same way. Your body doesn't deal with them the same way, and they don't completely resorb. So in the end, your percentage of vital bone in an area where you use a xenograft or a synthetic will not be as high. Okay, so there are times where you might want to use a, a xenograft, like let's say if you're doing a a pontic site where you know you, you're not going to put an implant and you just want that that material to stay there forever, that would be a place where you'd use a xenograph. 
Um, but if you're talking about an implant site, you want as, as high a percentage of vital bone as, co as possible. Uh, throughout the 80s, I used a lot of uh, BioOS, which is a cow bone. Um, it was very popular uh, at that time. And when you'd go back to place your implant, you'd be still drilling through a lot of that, of that bio loss. It wouldn't be totally resorbed. Um, uh, did it work? Yeah, it still worked. But, you know, what I found personally is that some of those uh, implants that I did in the, in the 80s and, and, and 90s that were very successful for 10, 20 years, um, over time as the person uh, tended to be challenged physically or not as healthy, those areas tended to break down. Um, I, it's not a study, and I don't know that it's because of less vital bone, but in the end, the more vital bone that you can have, the better. So that's uh, why, you know, allograft is, is kind of your, your gold standard behind an autograft. So then is, your, is most of your allograft uh, sourcing cadaver bone? Yes. <laughs> and yes. Is, does that weird uh, dentist out, or are they pretty good with that? I mean, do you get many people? You know, I, I you know used Allograph for you know like twenty five years, and, and every once in a while you'll get somebody that uh, has an objection uh, to it. Um, you know, saying that oh, you know, I don't want somebody else's bone. But I would say very rare. You know, you you, you explain it to them it's like a skin graft. It's like if, if you're getting a, a tendon or you're getting a, a, a retina uh, from from a donor, it's like a uh, an organ donor. And people just don't have a problem with it. They're yeah. very, very safe. Even the CDC has done some studies on it, and there's there's almost never any connection between an allograft tissue implantation and a complication that comes directly from that. So it, it's very safe, and if you reassure patients of that and dentists of that, there's really no problem. But but I, I mean, I'll, but a quarter of the the quarter of Americans say that the CDC is just a shill for big pharma, and they uh, and, and they call vaccinators pro disease i mean and you're probably out there in the worst of it. in california i can't imagine how crazy it is in california <laughs> i mean, I mean the, state, the west coast i mean uh, washington has a, 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 a measles emergency sent out i mean it's just Jeez. amazing how uh science is uh you know when i was involved with water fluoridation in two campaigns in 89 and then it expired after 20 years so we just had to do it again a couple of years ago and it was amazing how upset and crazy. Basically, a quarter of all Arizonans are just batshit crazy. Was telling me that uh, <laughs> fluoride was a poison. Uh, that the, yeah. the the mining companies in Arizona they have this fluoride byproduct and it's so toxic. There's nowhere to put it. They can't put it anywhere. So they bribe the politicians to pour it into the water slowly. And I'm like, dude, they've, they've detonated nuclear bombs out here. You, you don't think they can pour it around the, uh, you know, um, uh, those, those areas. But so, so um, you know, this is Dentistry Uncensored. They come out $400,000 of student loans. If they graft a uh, extraction site, is there an insurance code for this? Or is this only cash? Is, is this something that middle class America I mean, does Delta have a code for bone grafting? What is it? What is it? Can you talk about the business of bone grafting? Sure. So one of the things that we do, we do teach in the course as well is we go over the, the dental codes and, and how to bill it. Um, I think the, the main differentiation is that um, once you're uh, grafting a socket, uh, it becomes a surgical procedure. So. Uh, the, the main thing is you, you're, you're no longer using that 7110 code for a simple extraction. You're using the, the, the 7210, uh, which is, or the 7140 now? Yeah. 7140 it became uh, for a surgical extraction uh, because it is surgery. So uh, I like to kind of kid around, but even if you, you take the tooth out with your fingers, uh, it's a surgical extraction because you're going to take a blade and you're gonna go in and you're gonna make a 360 degree cut around that granulation tissue, that soft tissue that's gotten into the socket, then you're gonna use your surgical curette, you're gonna clean out all that granulation tissue, you're gonna get good heal, good good bleeding in the bone, you're gonna place your graft material, you're gonna suture that, you're gonna uh, place a membrane, suture it, so that's a surgical procedure. So no matter what market you're in, it, whatever your your fee was for a simple extraction, your surgical extraction should be at least double that fee. 
So just there alone, you've covered your cost of your uh, graph material and, and an additional profit. Um, in addition, you would bill for the, for the bone graph material, and there's a, a code for that as well. Um, most insurance companies do not pay for the bone graph material, although if you get into medical billing, you can bill for bone grafting um, if you code it properly. So there, there, there's a, a lot of ways, but in the end, um, when you know you're preserving the bone and you explain that to your patients, I don't have very many patients, no matter what their their socioeconomic background is, that say, yeah, I'd, I'd like this part of my face to, to sink in and, and to collapse, when instead you could do a bone graft and a couple hundred dollars more, and you're going to preserve the bone. So, and it's then, a lot. Of, it's a lot cheaper to preserve bone than to rebuild it later. So, if someone is considering, oh, I don't want to pay this couple hundred bucks for a bone graft, and then they leave and go buy some new shoes, then that's you know they had some extra money that they spent on shoes. And in that scenario, we need to be a little bit better conveying the importance of this to our patients. So they maybe choose this month. I'm not going to buy that extra pair of shoes. I'm going to pay for this bone graft and save myself a lot of money in the long run. So you're basically um, providing the courses to learn how to do these, these hands-on courses for bone grafting. And then your Correct. site, Surgical Aesthetics, actually sells the bone grafting material. Mm -hmm. So we sell the bone grafting material, we sell the instruments. So basically we make it a no-brainer. If you come to the course, um, you get the instruments, you get the graft material, and you're ready to start grafting. We've really curated things so that people are buying what they need but nothing more so if you take a look at like one of our instrument kits it's our frawley signature instrument kit and we got a little sick of getting instrument kits from other companies where you buy 20 instruments and you use 10 of them and the others you either don't know what they're supposed to do or they you know they just sit in the corner of the cassette and you never use them so we weeded those out and built a kit that has what you need and nothing more and then we show you how to use every single instrument the way it was designed how to use it most efficiently, how to hold it, you know, hand position, all of that kind of stuff. So when you walk out, you have what you need and nothing extra that's just gonna go in the sterilizer too many times. Yeah, you got a really neat website. When you go to surgicalaesthetics.com forward slash shop, I mean, you got it all there. You got the, the collagen wound dressing, you got the surgical instruments. Um, I mean, you, you got every, everything, everything there. I mean, it looks, it looks very well done. Um, and how, and when are your uh, CE events? So we do post those on the website as well and on our uh, Facebook page. So we have several coming up, one that's uh, in Iowa in a couple of weeks. Um, then we have one here in Los Angeles. It's actually a live surgical course at the end of the month. Uh, we do live surgical courses uh, in Mexico. And then as we announce more courses around the country, we post them up on the website there. Now, why do you, why do, you do it in Mexico? So they can do dentistry without a license? With, so, so if they came to California, the li their license in Minnesota wouldn't be valid? Well, and there are better tacos down there in Mexico too. But, but <laughs> is that mainly the, the issue? Yeah, so the, the, actually we do get temporary licenses when we're, when we're at the, the Mexico clinic we use is, is a kind of a missionary clinic that's a, a standalone dental building. It's a, it's a full-time dental clinic in addition so that, you know, patients are getting the dentistry for free. Obviously, there's not, not a big liability issue. People don't sue, you know, so that's an issue of why people go out of the country. For the live surgical course that we do in California, uh, as long as people sign up a month in advance, we can get them a temporary license through the state board. Really, you can? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because one thing that's been very big in Arizona, and I talked about a lot, and now it's taken off in uh, New Jersey and Florida, is that in Arizona, um, the board says if you go to um, these uh, these homeless shelters, there's a, there's a couple of dental offices and homeless shelters, and uh, they say um, like Brighter Way in downtown Phoenix. So any dentist right. can come down there and if you're doing dentistry on a homeless veteran, uh, you do not need, uh, you know, you just have to have an active license in, in the United States. So right. that's really taking off because, exactly. because we're all three men. I've had a lot of women tell me that they don't really want to go to some of these foreign countries by themselves. You know, they, right. they, right. I, I mean, Mexico, I mean, each year in Mexico, as many people 
are killed in Mexico as we lost the entire 10 year Vietnam War. They're, they're having about 60 to 70,000 murders a year. Isn't that just, I mean, crazy. yeah, that, that yeah. is crazy. But uh, yeah, so I see you're coming up on, um, you have an ICOI symposium in Los Angeles. And then you say, join us at the ICO symposium in Arizona. So that's February 14 to the 16. You'll be in Arizona. Well, sometimes we have uh, we have a team of sales reps around the country. So depending on what the event is that's coming up and which show or symposium, then we have a, a rep who attends that event. We won't be teaching at that this year, though. We just like to have events up on the website. So, um, so basically, um, talk about the difference between pulling a tooth and placing an extraction that day versus pulling a tooth and grafting an implant later. Why, why do you, t just talk about that. Why, 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 why do you sometimes do immediate extraction and immediate placement and other times have an intermediate, you know, extract, graft and implant later? It, it, this is one of my favorite topics actually, Howard. Um, I, I, it still kind of blows me away the, 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 the push now and, and how popular it, it has become to extract and do an immediate implant. Uh, it just seems like, you know, people are so in a rush and have no patience and, you know, want to get the implant in, you know, get the restoration on there, move everything along. Um, and, you know, there's certainly times when that's appropriate. Um, but no matter what anybody says, if you're doing an immediate implant, there's more complications. There's, there's more risk. Um, there's, you know, different surgical expertise that's necessary. So I really recommend, especially when you're in the beginning of your journey, uh, that you take the tooth out, you graft it, you let it heal so that you have a nice, predictable site, uh, much nicer to place the implant in, much simpler, much less chance for complication. So you wait the three to four months, you go back, you place the implant, uh, you let that heal, another three three months or so and then you do the restoration um you know people are only in a rush if it's in our mind that they're in a rush if people understand that there's better chances for healing if we allow the graft to heal and go back to place the implant i i just don't have anybody sit, coming to me saying oh no i can't do that i got to do it right away um so i think there's way too big an emphasis on immediate implants now again that there's certainly times when it's appropriate. And I think as your skill level increases, um, it becomes more appropriate. But for somebody that's in the beginning of their journey, you know, they, they've only placed, you know, 10, 20 implants maybe. I think you, especially if you're talking about the aesthetic zone, you should have placed 50, 100 implants before you're, you're routinely placing uh, immediates in the anterior in the aesthetic zone. Um, well, it reminds me, um, you, you would understand this more if you go back to that. Uh, I graduated dental school, uh, or there's something about Mary in 1988. Remember when the hitchhiker said, uh, yeah, think yeah. about it. You walk yeah. in, you see eight minute abs in there. Then there's a seven minute abs right next to it. Which one are you going to yeah. pick, man? And he says, bingo, man, seven minute abs. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the obsession with, you know, if someone has eight minute abs, do it in seven minutes or uh, yeah. just immediate. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, it's scary. These kids don't realize that, um, man, you gotta be, you, you gotta have 10,000 hours under your belt to start doing riskier cases. And you start off with easy cases. Um, and and, exactly. and a, lot of, a lot of them think exactly backwards. Like they think, oh, well, she just lost this anterior tooth. That'll be an uh, easy implant right smart. there. And it's like some attractive woman with a high lip line. It's like, man, that's, yeah. that's level four. <laughs> Um, do you agree that the first implants place should be uh, replacing uh, six-year molars and maxillary second by cuspids? Is that usually where you recommend starting? I think any posterior tooth, but I, I but the main thing about that is I, I really recommend you know grafting the area, letting it heal, and go back and placing it into a healed area. It's just simpler, more straightforward. You get you get the sense of learning how tissue heals. You get the sense of handling tissue. You're you get more keratinized tissue, so you're able to get a better healing around the implant. Uh, it's, it's just it's just the, the way to go. And another thing, I want to just zap out of your head. A lot of people right now think that you know you got you got uh, what is it Yomi? That's a uh, uh, robot assisted or implant surgery. They think they can get a CBCT. 
build a surgical guide and robots in China are placing implants. So yeah. man, you, you don't you, you don't even need to be a surgeon to place implants. Stevie Wonder could do it with the guy in surgery. Yeah. And that is so wrong. And you said in, initially, you should become a surgeon yeah. first. I mean, you should get rid, you should get really good at exodontia, pulling wisdom yeah. teeth, get your surgical skills down. And if you think you're gonna be a bloodless, uh, bleaching, bonding, Invisalign, veneer, yeah. and place implants without blood, you're very confused. Yeah. Absolutely. You've really got to learn the basics, the analog way of doing things, because what happens when you make one of these surgical guides or use this fancy software and equipment and then the guide doesn't quite fit or the guide broke or your assistant lost it and then you're not prepared to do it analog. So you really need to have that foundation before you start adding in you know, newer technologies and things that can make your life easier if they work really well, but can really be a problem if you try to implement it and then something doesn't go right and then you got nothing to fall back on. I remember what, one of the first guys that I made many years ago, um, you know, paid 300, $350 for the guide, whatever it was, and I'm all excited about doing it, doing it guided, <laughs> and it was a second molar, and I go and put it in, the guy couldn't open big enough for me to get the drill into the guide. <laughs> right. So it's just, there's stuff happens, you know? I mean, it, as much as we try to plan and as much as everything's digitally wonderful, what if it's off? And you can't, uh, you, one of the things I really impress, especially in our live surgical courses, is don't think a guide's 100%. Don't take your brain out of it, you know? You go and you start building, make sure it all makes sense. You know, think about it, look at it. You know, if something's off, you may be drilling in the sinus and not even realize it. You, you, you can't take yourself out of the equation. And how long do you like to have these uh, graphs heal um, before you're uh, going back and placing an implant, with with the uh, with you know all allografts are different. That's another thing. That, you know, people think that bone is bone is bone, and it's not. You know, all allografts are processed differently. Uh, they're using different quality of bone. Um, the more powdery the bone is, the the less uh, the less it'll heal well. It won't provide a good scaffold for the bone. So. With the surgical aesthetics bone, we designed a, a particular porosity uh, so that it really absorbs blood very well, creates a great scaffold. So we, with our material, uh, we're showing that when you go back at three months, uh, all of the bone graft material has been resorbed. We're getting a really high percentage of vital bone that we've shown with histology. Uh, so for our materials, uh, three months is sufficient before you go back and place the implant. Do you think, um... I mean, I mean, there's two million dentists alive on Earth now. It, it's hard to get that number, and and you got to understand the definition of dentistry. My definition of a dentist is someone who their full time occupation is, is a dentist. So you might be in a town of five thousand without running water and electricity, but whenever they get sick, they go to this guy, and he removes their teeth, he makes partials, he makes sense. So it's about two million dentists, and about a million of them practice like we do in the United States. The United States has. 211,000 Americans who are alive with an active license to practice dentistry. What percent of those 211,000 dentists do you think right now today bone graft after extractions? Uh, that's a good question, but it, it it's definitely lower than, than I would have thought, you know, when I started doing this stuff. Um, my guess is probably only about 10, 15% maybe. Yeah, most schools don't teach it as far as I know. I have a few friends who have come out of dental school where they teach them theoretically that you should be grafting and even fewer that actually teach you how to do grafting. But I think by and large, uh, I, people I know, are not. I know, I know kids school. that graduated $400,000 student loans and all they learned in ortho was cranial facial development and embryology and, you know, all, <laughs> the, all this stuff like that. And I say, well, did you do a, like a single... RPE or a did you do a, a, a one Invisalign case? No, we had yeah. we had a, a semester yeah. on em, on facial embryonics. I mean, it's just uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's sad. Um, so um, so there's also so when when do you, do you think this is moving toward a standard of care or is that way too premature to even talk about something like that? No, I think it's moving towards the standard of care. I mean. You know, Gordon Christensen's talked a lot about it. You know, he, he, in dental economics, he, you know, came out, he, this was already a couple of years ago, saying that he th he believes it's becoming the standard of care. Um, I know California has a very active 
The Dental Association has a very active peer review system, and so a number of cases have come up before peer review um, where you know uh, grafting was not done, and there was a huge collapse and caused big problems for being able to place an implant. And it's been found in the in the patient's favor uh, each time that grafting was not offered as a procedure. So, you know, I, I don't think you can absolutely say it's a standard of care now, but it's becoming. And and I think it's the right way to practice. We should offer that to our patients. So I, I agree. I think it's the 80-20 rule. I, I think 20% have done some grafting to a lot. Um, do, do, sure. is it, it, it's got to be much higher amongst periodontists. Um, what what percent of periodontists you think bone graft after an extraction? I would say ninety ninety five percent. Yeah, so the, so that that's your big clue there. If if the if the periodontists are doing it ninety percent of the time and the general dentists are doing it ten to twenty percent of the time, uh, you know which direction this market's going to be. I, I can just assure sure. you. Um, sure. And, and and so now, do you get on past the grafting? Do you teach any implant placement? Yes, we do. So we uh, in the in the hands-on course, we also do a hands-on implant uh, portion where we'll place an implant on some models and we'll talk about you know implant systems in general. And then the the course that we do, the live surgical course, we teach both grafting and and implant placement. Um, so yeah, that's definitely you know part of the journey that we. So part of one of the things that that we kind of morphed into as a company. Um, is rather than just be a supplier, we really uh, kind of morphed into being mentors. Uh, so that once somebody's taken our courses, then we have a, a Facebook group that people can join, post cases, get advice if they want to email me a case, call up. I've, I've done some mentoring at people's offices where they just couldn't get started. Even though they took our live surgical course, they still didn't, didn't feel confident enough to get going. And so I've spent a day in their office so our, our goal is really, once they're using our materials, they've taken our courses, is to stay in touch with them, to, to help them, you know, for us to become part of their journey. You know, that's really what, what, what we're doing as a company. So um, in the United States, um, a lot of the implant surgical courses are actually provided by the manufacturers. And a lot of the emails I get and a lot of the um, questions I see on Dentaltown, a lot of people think, um, do I need to pick the implant system and then take their training? Or is it like driver's ed where you just learn how to drive a car and then when you get your license to drive, you can drive any car? Uh, is there an implant you recommend? Um, the Cologne meeting is coming up here. It's the biggest meeting in the world. It's every other year in Europe, about 100,000 dentists goes. If I told you how many implant companies have a booth there, you wouldn't even believe me. You wouldn't even believe me but it's close yeah. to 400. So she's 25 years old. Uh, you, you, you've been doing this for so long that two of your kids are dentists. She just wants a yeah. brand name. What implant system would you recommend? She doesn't want to go figure out 400 different systems. Yeah, so I, obviously, you know, I've uh, probably used 10, 15 different systems over the years. I mean, I started, when I started placing actually in 81, when I got out of dental school, uh, it was really only IMZ and Branamark, and at that time, for with Branamark, if you weren't uh, a specialist, they wouldn't uh, sell to you. You know, you you couldn't be part of their their system. So, uh, at that time, a, a guy Alex Kirsch out of, out of Germany had the IMZ system. You know, and then um, you know, there, then there became knockoffs. But I think the bottom line is that uh, you know most implant systems work today. So. I think it starts coming down to kind of a reasonable cost and and what's working in most applications, what has, uh, you know, designed prosthetically so that it's easy to work with. So right now I'm working with uh, the Megagen implant um, and the uh, IDS uh, company, um, Integrated Dental Systems, who is the supplier in the United States for Megagen. Um, it's an implant that has an aggressive thread um, it, it has high stability, easy to use. Um, one of the things I like about it is that the platform on is the same for all different sizes of implants, so you don't have to have separate impression copings and healing abutments. It really reduces the numbers of parts. Um, and so, you know, that's the system that we use when we're teaching a live surgical course. 
But again, we've had many people take our course that are using different systems and the principles apply. You know, the, the surgical principles that we teach, the instrumentation, it applies to no, any system that, that you're using, really. I think one of the biggest things to think about, too, when choosing an implant is the support associated with it. How we have morphed, you know, our company to be able to support our users with bone graft. You got to find an implant company that supports the users as well. So I think a lot of that would come down to, you know, finding a reputable company, talk to their reps, see which one you think is going to be there, is going to answer your calls, is going to, you know, answer questions for your staff, maybe train your staff on how to use the restorative parts and take impressions and that kind of thing. You know, so much of it comes down to, it, yeah, it's a great product, but can I implement it into my practice? And some of that has to do with how well your staff understands it and can order parts, keep inventory up. And so having a good supportive company is, is really important. And I think, you know, having done this with a couple different uh, companies, IDS is, is really helpful. Uh, the Megagen IDS reps really support their customers. And, and I think it, it works really well that way. Yeah, um, we've had the founder of Megagen. And by, by the way, none of these are commercials. They, they didn't pay me to come on my show and talk about their website. Yeah. I reached out to them. They didn't reach out to me. Um, the the um, founder, uh, I've had uh, lunch with him and gone to his courses in Phoenix and all that. And I, I, I think uh, Megagen's secret was comes down to one thing, that and that's just called product cycle. I think the everybody else would get an idea They'd ship it out to all these ideas at dental schools. They want funding. They get grad soon. It'd take them years and years and years to, to get back with research and say, this design does this or that. And the founder, uh, uh, Dr. Park of Megagen, he he first had a hundred dentist dental office that he owned. It's like a 10 story right. building. So he'd get right. the idea for the implant. He would mach have it machined out by, he'd have a hundred of them made in his dental office by Friday. And then he'd have his hundred <laughs> dentists place them all the following Monday, and in and in right. six months. I mean, so his product cycle. I mean, he. I mean, he, he always says, "I come to a fork in the road. I do it this way, that way. This way is better than that way." Next, and his product cycle is just so fast. Yeah, Dr. Park is an amazing guy. They built this just incredible facility, and uh, it's just really impressive. You know what what they've done. Um, have you been yeah, to South Korea? Yeah, I have not been there yet. No, you have not been there. Uh, that is uh, an amazing yeah. civilization. Um, it, yeah. it just really is amazing. Um, and uh, but anyway, um, I also on your courses on your CE events, you you post all the World Implant Immersion Course uh, dates. And Kevin, your faculty on there, um, talk Correct. about that. Okay, so. Um, the, the, the Whirly course uh, is is really a terrific course. Uh, I've, I've taught in a couple of different live surgical courses, um, but the thing that, that is unique about um, about the course in Puebla is a couple of things. Uh, Puebla, California? One, Mexico. This, is, well, this okay. one's in Puebla, Mexico. Is it across okay. the city? What, what city is it across in America? Is it across San Diego, El Paso? Where, where's no, that? so it, it's like it's like a two-hour flight, an hour and okay. forty-five minutes flight out of Dallas. Okay. Okay. And Puebla is is high up in the mountains, uh, so it isn't really a, a kind of a drug city or a, or you know, there's not not much going on other than Volkswagen has its biggest plant in the world is in Puebla, so it, it's pretty much kind of kind of run by that so the crime rate is very low so that's that's really not an issue but the the unique thing about Puebla is that uh Mike Worley uh started kind of the 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 deal started 10 12 years ago as kind of a missionary clinic and so he got together um and with uh the church group they built a, a dental facility which is uh what 810 operatories mm -hmm. um and it's 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 in a compound. So when you're picked up at the airport, you go right to the compound. So there there's no kind of security issues because uh, the the compound also has the living quarters and the eating quarters. So you don't have to go back and forth to hotels. You don't have to go back and forth to restaurants. And so one of the unique things again, because it's a full time dental clinic, the Mexican dentists that are practicing practicing there full time work up all the cases. So that w when we get there as, as faculty and students, we're reviewing and planning all the cases before you see the patients. 
you see the patients, uh, you do the procedures, we take, you know, post-op CBCTs, um, we take uh, uh, CBCTs during the procedure so that you, you know your regulations, you know what you're doing. Um, and then at the end of the day, we review all those cases. So different than most, most other out of country courses where you're kind of rushing back and forth to hotels, you don't really get to do the, the, the pre-op planning and the post-op review that you get to do in this course because you're eating and sleeping in the same facility. So that makes it completely unique. Um, Plus, in addition to the implants you actually place when you're in that course, since you're reviewing your cases in front of everybody else, you know, pulling up the cone beams to show everyone else, you have to learn how to talk through it, articulate what you did, what you saw, why you made this decision. And so you learn more because you are teaching that to the group. And then everyone in the group is learning because not only are they reviewing their own cases, but the other 10, 15, 20 implants that were placed that day, they get to see those before, during, and after cone beams as well. So you learn a lot from what you actually do and a lot from what other people teach you while they're doing them during the course as well. The other, the other thing that uh, we do that's fairly unique, I think, compared to most other live surgical courses is that, um, so generally there's two dentists to a chair, they assist each other and they rotate back and forth, and there's one instructor to each chair. So it isn't like a situation where you've got one instructor handling six chairs. There's one instructor that's holding your hand, watching everything you do, how you hold the instruments, how you hold the handpiece, how, how you do everything, and, and guiding you all along the way. Huh. That, well, you, um, can you get Michael to come on the show? Uh, sure. sure. He, I'm sure he'd love to. Yeah, yeah and talk about his BAM Center and uh, Pueblo. So that, that's sure. by uh, Mexico City. Or kind of near. Do you, do you fly? Yeah, would, would you fly it's a couple hours from Mexico City. But do you yeah. fly into Mexico City then drive? Well, there's two ways to do it. Most of the time we'll fly into either Dallas or Houston, and then you could fly directly into Puebla. Okay, direct uh, from uh, Dallas. On United. Or you can fly into Mexico City and take a luxury bus, which is a couple hour bus ride. Uh, and I've done both ways. I've done so but many missionary trips in Mexico. I, I, I always love them. I. My first missionary trip was, you know, 30 years ago, and uh, it was so good for me because whenever, when you know, we um, we left Phoenix, and you know, I had four kids, a practice, I was really busy, and I, you know, I didn't even think I had time to do this, but some dental friends talked me into going with them, and the next thing you know, we're in Chiapas, Mexico, with 5,000 Chiapan uh, Indians who with no running water, no electricity or sewage. And it's just like, you know, yeah. when we were little, we went to Catholic school. So we always had to do these uh, retreats where Friday after yeah. school, you couldn't go home. You had to go to retreat. Hey, and, Howard, and, Howard, I did the same thing. I did the yeah. same exact thing. We're both yeah. Irish Catholic. And, and it was That's really right. good just because you just, you clocked out, you, you break your pattern and whether yeah. or not you, you know, just self-reflect for a weekend. And I was sitting down there in Chavez, Mexico, and um, my gosh, uh, just to unplug and to see these happy people that are so grateful. And it, and it was yeah. so amazing how they would stand in line with their babies for dental care, even at night. I remember one, a couple nights, it stormed all night long. And these stoic women are standing in the rain holding their baby because they know there's these missionary dentists and they want their, and, and we felt bad because after a 12 hour day, you're trashed and you're sitting out there drinking a beer and you think, you lazy, why, why are you sitting out here drinking a beer? Should you work 24 hours? They're standing there in line all night. I mean, it's, it's just yeah. so, uh, it's just such a, a good reboot. And that, that's really neat how he's mixing that, um, the BAM Center, which is uh, business yeah. as mission. But but his website yeah. bamcenter.org doesn't uh, work. Did he change the name of it or? Um, you know they may have. So so uh, Mike Worley is actually not. He doesn't run the BAM part of it. There's actually a it, there's a a main guy there who's just an incredible person. And then it's really supported by a couple of churches that kind of support that part of it. So when the whole idea of the BAM Center started, their main deal was was actually water water ministry. And they'd go out to these places like you just described and try to create clean water for them and, and get the wells so that they're, they're sterilizing the water so that people are not getting sick. So that's how that whole concept started. And so when Mike first kind of teamed up with them, he just went there and did extractions, you know, and, and they didn't have a dental clinic or anything. So it was really his vision. 
to build a full-time dental clinic. And so he, along with uh, uh, some other big, big donors, kind of bought the property and built this compound that has now this full-time dental clinic. Um, and the patients that are there for, for implants are getting all that for free. And like you said, I mean, these people are so appreciative and, you know, you you can beat them up like crazy and they're hugging you at the end just saying thank you so much. I mean, it's really heartwarming. It really is. And the other so thing, your, go ahead. That BAM website isn't, uh, it, it may not be real active or really updated, but the one that is active and updated and shows all the information about that course, you can get to it from our website, but also wic.org, so W-I-I-C.org. And that's where it really shows the pictures of the facility, the equipment, the grounds, you know, testimonials. That so WIIC.org, WIIC stands for Worley Implant Immersion Course. Correct. And, uh, yeah. and then he's a dentist in uh, Texas, right? He's over there in, uh, yeah. in, uh, he's in Dallas. He's in Dallas. And my, uh, yeah, right my, my son, Eric, and four of my five grandchildren are in Texas. So uh, I just spent a, a Christmas and New Year's out there. And uh, and, well, uh, and it's um it's amazing when you're working with your grandchildren how you know um, show touch feel beats talking to them any day of the week and I love how they call that an immersion course because um, you, you can walk around the swimming pool all day long and read books on swimming but there's nothing like just being thrown like my older <laughs> sister did to me yeah. I can still remember being scared at swimming lessons and my oldest sister who's now a nun just pushed me in the deep end. And uh, she and she told me she goes well you're either gonna drown or start swimming and uh, so within a few minutes you're dog paddling and it's all right um, so so you, you've taught so much um, you're talking about uh, the implant is Megagen is that the Ankylo system that you're recommending no so it's the the Any Ridge system I mean the Any Ridge system I'm sorry Any Ridge yeah so yeah so it's the Any Ridge system is the one I primarily use they have a number of different si systems as well and and some that are you know, kind of uh, imitations of other systems, but the Any Ridge is the unique system that I particularly like. It's got, you know, lots lots of really good qualities that I think are really important. Um, I love the uh, aggressive thread design. Um, I love the fact that when you're you're placing the implant, the core of the implant is significantly smaller than than where the threads are. So you're actually drilling away much less bone than with a typical system. I just got a, a lot of great design features. And what what are the other issues? Um, what are the other issues that you uh, uh, see in um, placing dental implants? Like, uh, by the way, I hope someday you give us an online C course. That'd be amazing. Yeah, for sure. Because uh, this, will... this bone grafting, and I like say, if if it's better, and I I know whenever you say dental insurance, people just think, ah, oh, you're horrible. You should just be insurance free and all that kind of stuff. But you know, this is a big country. There's 325 yeah. million people, and there's a lot yeah. of people that can pay cash for everything. But uh, I I look at the auto market. I mean, when you look at the auto market, I mean, it, it's scary. Um, la last year, what the numbers I was looking at: 17 million cars sold. Only 10 percent did they put it on their Visa or American Express or you know pay cash. Five million of those 17 million were leased. The reason most people lease them is not for tax advantage, but it's actually subprime lending. They didn't qualify for a loan, sure. so they qualify sure. for a lease. When 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 that last 2008 meltdown, um, Congress gets this big idea to just start passing all this regulation for finance banking reform, right? So what right. are, what do the Wall Street Wizards do? They just left the banks and they started peer-to-peer -peer lending and where you know you have to be a millionaire to don't so so anytime it's game theory. Whenever Congress passes a law and says you can't do it blue, how long will it take Wall Street to find another color? <laughs> yeah. An hour? Not too long. An hour? Yeah. So yeah. so all the <laughs> subprime lending through banks that got regulated away is now in peer-to-peer -peer lending. And these, sure. and so if you got five million people leasing a car because they don't they they don't approve a GMAC finance to finance their own damn car, it's a big market, and and the middle class is the biggest market, and that's the one I'm the most yeah. interested in because my entire damn pedigree is a is middle class Kansas Parsons Kansas. In fact, when we have a re a family reunion, usually the Centers of Disease Control shows up and starts taking DNA swabs, uh, <laughs> trying to find out what. Was it inbreeding? Was it just drinking? What the hell caused what caused this family reunion? But um, 
<laughs> so what um what other questions was i not smart enough to ask you what else would you want to talk about you know i i, I really think that um I, and you know i've kind of said this already but i think it's so important for people to have a concept of that you know because being a dentist and i think being successful in your practice it's a marathon it's not a sprint you know and and you know what what we want to do i mean what why private practice has been i feel amazing for me is because i know i've known people for 30 years i've known people the the grandparents the parents the kids and 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 that's what's rewarding so you know people aren't in a rush you know treat them as best as you can treat them the way you'd want to be treated do the right thing you know it's not about doing the fastest where you're going to make the most money it's about doing the right thing and you will you will have a very successful practice and and it just it just makes sense you know so learn learn from the ground up you know learn the techniques don't think okay i can just punch away all the keratinized tissue and throw an implant in in 40 minutes and wow i'm done i mean you know because then you're going to feel like crap when that implant fails for whatever reason and you don't know what to do about it you know um so you got to learn from the ground up and, uh, and that's really what surgical status would like to do to to help people i mean that that that's kind of become our mission you know i i think it's a how-to it's how do you do it to make it very predictable uh very straightforward where you're going to feel good about what you do you're going to feel good about how things heal um, and you're going to feel good about about what you're doing for your patients and making more money. So um, I know you're a busy dentist in Beverly Hills. We went over the hour. Do you need to go right now, or can I do some overtime questions? No, we're yeah, good. Go yeah, we're well, good. You know, I, we call it dentistry and censor because you know I, I just want to talk about what's real, and I don't care what anyone thinks about it. But one one of the most uh, you know most podcasts are audio, which I I recommend all my homies that are doing a dental podcast to do video and put them on YouTube because. Um, Google and YouTube are the two biggest search engines, but we, we put this up on YouTube and um, the interview I did with uh, Carl Mish got over 12,000 views, which is pretty high considering yeah. I only have 12,000 people subscribed to the channel, but I had 12,000 <laughs> views. But one of the That's most awesome. controversial things he said was uh, he, he wasn't a big uh, fan of drawing blood and spinning and there's PRF. Um, and, uh, you know, some people swear by it. Carl was saying, that's voodoo. There's no research on that. Even amongst my friends. I mean, I got some drinking buddies in Phoenix. Now, when you're drinking a beer, watching the football game, eating cheeseburgers, I don't even want to, that conversation to go up because some are just <laughs> adamant that it's voodoo and others are adamant. And, 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 and you're talking about both camps that have placed thousands and thousands of implants. So you, I want you to weigh in it. Um, do you think to be an implantologist, you need to learn how to draw blood and start spitting it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So you're in the camp not. with Carl. Yeah, but but to be honest, I do it, um, but not all the time. And um, I can say my results, I think that, um, I think you get better soft tissue healing, you know, not so critically that it you know it makes a hundred percent difference. I think you get better soft tissue healing. I can't say that, uh, and I've used the sticky bone technique and every different technique. I can't t really honestly tell the difference with bone grafting whether I when I do it or when I don't do it. I really can't, you know, from a clinical point of view, I can't tell the difference. And I don't think, to my knowledge, that there's no research that's well-designed, double-blind clinical research that's shown that, you know, mixing the PRF, making sticky bone ha has increased your results. So I do think that there's soft tissue applications. You get some better healing. You know, when you make the, uh, the PRF membrane, if you're doing the sinus lift and you've had a perforation, it works well to, to, you know, take care of that perforation. But in the end, it's not absolutely necessary by any means. Um, to sum up, Carl, um, bless his soul, when he died, I mean, that was so sad. Um, but it, um, to sum him up, he says, there is little evidence that PRF added to a bone substitute improving the outcome. He, he just said, and he, his deal was, look, look, you know, show me the research or go away. And uh, But then there's a lot of things that, um, you know, it, it's... No, I, I 
I think that's absolutely true. Uh, I, I, I want to yeah, ask they, another thing. Um, um, are you a um, cementer or a screwer? Um, and, and, when I'm, <laughs> and when I'm talking about that, remember the real world is that almost all the dentistry, I mean, it's about an 80 20 rule, but about 80% of all the dentistry is done on four, six year molars. I mean, you ever sit down with an insurance guy who's got a billion dollars worth of claims data spread out on 32 teeth? You just, I mean, which tooth is most likely to have MOD filling, a crown, a molar root canal, yep. an extraction? Yep. I mean, and you just see these four monster spikes on three, I 14, 19, and, and 30. So on, so just, we're talking to podcasters, so they're under 30. She's doing a single implant crown, replacing a six-year molar. Would you cement it or screw it? Okay, so, per, and I've done both, you know, personally. Um, I think the thing to keep in mind is that your main complication in implant dentistry is uh, retained cement. That, that's the complication. If you have subgingival margins of your abutment and you cement a healthy tissue, you cement a crown, there's almost no way that you're going to get the cement out from underneath the crown. So that basically leaves two options. You either screw retain it or um, you have a custom above it. So personally, um, I have all custom above it. I'm, I'm a CEREC user, so uh, I design um, uh, most of my abutments and crowns and um, I'll both mill the abutments and I'll also uh, send away my design, have some titanium abutments milled so that I have all uh, either at the tissue level or super gingival margins, and then I cement. The thing that I don't like about screw retained uh, is that they're very difficult to try in. If you're trying in a crown and it's screw retained and the tissue is, is squishing and you're trying to adjust your interproximal contacts, it's a real pain in the neck. Um, so, when, so when I have used screw retained, most of the time I'm using a uh, for lack of a better term, a screw mentable technique where I'll have the uh, the titanium uh, ab abutment on the on the tissue. I'll try the crown in, then I'll take off the tie base, uh, cement it outside the mouth, and then screw retain it. I, I, I for me trying in a screw retained when it's totally subgingival is a pain in the butt. Well, no pain in the neck. The butt it'd be, you'd be yeah. the implant would be in the wrong end. Yeah. You had the yeah. you had the chair positioned wrong if it was painted yeah. by. Um but yeah. um and, and then um sorry to keep asking you more questions, but there's a no, there's a tremendously huge uh, by the way, I wouldn't give anything for an online C course on using your CIRAC to make a custom abutment. That would be oh my god. Yeah. And Dent Splice Serona would love you for it because I know uh um they uh they um they used to have an exclusive with Patterson and then they, they don't do that anymore and they're uh, they they would love to get that information. Uh, another big big huge controversy is dentistry uncensored. Uh, guided surgery or freehand? You know I, I do both. Um, you know I've, I've done you know enough implants over many many years so that you know for my posterior implants I do them freehand um, just because you know I'm very comfortable doing it. If I'm concerned at all about the buccal lingual dimension of the bone. Um, and again, because I'm a CEREC user, I do mill an in-office guide for single teeth, so it makes it simple. So I will will use a guide in that situation. Um, I think if you're doing an anterior uh, implant and you have limited bone, the guide certainly helps. Um, but I think the most important thing of all of that is, uh, I think it's critical that everybody have a CBCT at this point. Um, you know, it's just- What brand? The, um, I have a, uh, a, a, a Galileos, you know, a Serona because I bought it initially together with the, uh, the whole Serona system. But I think today there's a number of different brands that are excellent. Um, and ha a, a lot is you want to look at the software and be sure you're comfortable with the software. Um, I personally, if you're going to make that investment, I would never get a limited view. You know, once you're going to do it, go for the full view. Um, again, when, you, when you're looking at what your payment will be uh, when you're leased to buy or you, or you have a loan on it, if you take 
three or four views a month, you're you're making your payment. I mean, it's just, you can't not make money on it. It just makes total sense. You know, for, for the endos that I do, uh, it's just awesome to be able to look at that three-dimensional view and look at all the roots individually. I think it's just critical. Um, but I think the main thing about, about doing it freehand is I think you want to, when you've made your initial osteotomy, you're going to want to take a, a, a guide pin shot and look at where you are because I would say I've been doing it 30 years and still when I take that guide pin shot, I'll usually make a little adjustment. Uh, in the, either the buccal ingle dimension or the mesiodistal uh, uh, dimension. So I think a guide pin shot is really critical. Uh, okay, my, my final question, it's going to be more of a rant, and I want you to just try to answer this rant. Um, sure. <laughs> bad, bad stuff. Um, we're hearing, okay, so when I got out of school 31 years ago, uh, the periodontists were doing all these surgeries and hemisections and all these uh, surgical treatments. And then about 10 years out of school, the market starts saying, you know what, the best way to treat gum disease, is just extract the tooth and place an implant. And then about 20 years out of school, people are sitting there seeing that after five years, a third of these implants have periimplantitis. And after 10 years, it's more like, you know, 40%. And then there's like, well, how are you treating the periimplantitis? You know, there's people selling Lenap lasers for periimplantitis. Um, there's some people saying, you know, that, you know, implants is not a cure for gum disease. You got to get the gum disease under control because you pull the natural tooth and put in titanium, you still got gum disease. So there's got to be a, your final question in there somehow. Will you rant about periimplantitis? Do you need a Lenap laser to treat it? Do you think people are putting too many implants in people that have untreated perio? Um, I, I'm such a bad podcast interviewer that I just throw out like 20 <laughs> questions hoping one of them is good enough for you to uh, pick an answer we agree <laughs> yes to all those questions yes to all those questions that question was a throw it on the wall technique and something's gonna stick right right <laughs> um so um I I do think obviously you want to have your you know your your periodontal condition under control before you're, you know, you don't want somebody with rapid perio disease and you're placing an implant for sure. So if, you, if, if they need some, some quadrants of root plane and they need to get their, uh, all of, you know, their perio under control, obviously that you want to do that. That just makes sense. Um, as far as um, uh, perio surgery goes, I do think that, um, that things have changed. If you've got some pretty large vertical defects, um, and you're, you're trying to treat that with some resective kind of surgery and you're taking away more bone, that probably doesn't make sense today. So I think, you know, it, it makes more sense to preserve bone and go towards the implant today. Um, I think where, where I've had a dilemma and I look at my cases over 30 years is, you know, I, when we, a lot of the teeth that didn't have, um, uh, didn't have gum disease, but uh, teeth were fractured off of the gum line and I went and put you know, three posts in a molar and I built them up and I did a crown and, and everything looked beautiful. And, you know, eight, 10 years down the road, the, the post fractured and then, you know, the tooth fractured. So now I think there's a, there's a, a dilemma on, you know, if, if you've got to use posts and you're building up a tooth and the bone is really good around the tooth, do you, you know, go ahead and do that knowing that there's a pretty high chance down the road, some of those posts will fracture teeth or do you elect to extract the tooth and place an implant, knowing that if you're doing everything well and the person doesn't have a lot of, uh, you know, bone issues, there's a good chance that implant will be there for the rest of their life. So I think that that is a, a bit of a of a question that you know we each have to answer for ourselves. Um, I think that's that's an issue. Um, as far as peri implantitis goes, you know, you know, I'm not sure that I believe all of the the kind of the hype from the Lenat people as far as how it treats and, you know, or in the, in the average dentist hand, does it do that? Yes, they show cases uh, for their $120,000 laser, whatever. They show cases where they've used it and then bone fills in. But is that the average case? Is that what happens for most people? I don't know that. They don't have, you know, well done clinical research to show that if you do 100 cases, 
you know, 80 of them are going to end up with the bone fill, you know. So I don't know that that's a real viable, reasonable alternative. Um, I, I, you know, I have a lot of cases and I can show my cases where I've lost, you know, bone on, you know, two, three, four threads and some of them that are exposed. And yet with good oral hygiene, they seem pretty darn stable, you know. So I don't know that there's a good answer, you know, to your to your question, Howard. Um, I know that trying, if there's a vertical defect on an implant, trying to get that to heal is very difficult. Um, and so then there's a, a, a question about, okay, if you've got a pretty good vertical defect, but there's good bone horizontally around the implant, is it probably better just to take out the implant, graft it and put another implant uh, versus, you know, try to try to save the implant. But if, if the implant's involved in complicated prosthetics, then you're going to want to try to save that implant. So there's probably not one good answer. Uh, but I think, again, clinical experience goes a long way in one's own practice. Um, and that's, again, one of the reasons that we have the support with our our surgical aesthetics Facebook group is because a lot of dentists in smaller communities uh, don't have anybody to turn to, to to ask questions to. So, you know, that's why we use our, our forum where people can post cases and a lot of the instructors that teach with us will then give their opinions on what they would do with a particular case. Um, so, you know, it's kind of one of the missions of, of our company, you know, to, to, to be there, to be that uh, that mentor for for people that that are again on their journey so you're saying that you know they can advertise and show a case of where the bone grew back and i can show you a picture of me at a restaurant eating a salad with an iced tea but that would not yeah. be that would not be the yeah. average restaurant scenario yeah. for me um but um so um well hey um gosh i'd love to get any online c course you want to do i think it'd be good for the townies it'd be a lot of prestige at dental town uh, I think it'd be good uh, marketing for your brand. Uh, it was just an honor today that you guys took your time Thank you. to come on That's my show Thank and talk to my homies driving to work or the unlucky bastard ones that are stuck on a treadmill for an hour. Uh, I'd rather be stuck in traffic than stuck on a treadmill. But hey, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was just an honor to podcast both of you.